Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five. I am your host, curator Kevin Adkisson with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today we are over at the Cranbrook Institute of Science. And I wanted to, on this very exciting day, one of my favorite collaborations between Aliel Saarinen and George Booth. Now, it was Aero Saarinen who said that, uh, uh, or, or who wrote once that every project at Cranbrook is half a George Booth project. And so George Booth, as founder of Cranbrook, uh, was intimately involved in the design of so many of the individual elements and the institutions. I mean, this was a man who, during the construction of the boys' school, was taking his drafting board to the project. Uh, with the construction of Kingswood School for Girls, uh, George Booth was counting electrical outlets and saving uh, sort of $11 at a time by, by removing electrical outlets. So George Booth was not just a patron, but he was actively involved in the design. But today's element, the Cranbrook Institute of Science light pylon, which I'm hoping while they're doing it here in the midwinter, it will actually come on during our tour, is really something that is a, um, a real collaboration between the architect Aliel Saarinen and uh, George Booth himself. So the Institute of Science, which I did in a live at five many months ago, probably seven months ago, um, opened on May 5th, 1938. And the building that the Institute of Science opened in was this blocky structure right here. And so the Institute, which in that other Live at Five, and I'm sure in a later time, I'll talk more about the history of the Institute, but the, the shortest version of the story is that Mr. and Mrs. Booth were traveling back from uh, out west and they stopped in uh, Denver when they ran into a gem and mineral shop and they bought over 200 specimens uh, to start uh, what they thought initially would be something for the boys school to study gems and minerals. With the completion of Cranbrook School for Boys, those minerals were put in the lower level uh, and the telescope was on top of that tower at the boys school. In the uh, end, the telescope didn't really work there. It was a little bit tight up the spiral staircase. It was clouded by a chimney put right next to it. And so Mr. Booth ended, move, ended up moving the telescope here to the middle of campus where it would be perfectly dark. And so here is that uh, original observatory, new telescope at the original building designed by George Booth. Downhill from this observatory, they ended up building a little zoo. And then in 1936, Aliel Saarinen began design work to connect George Booth's observatory, reclad it in brick, and then build his own Institute of Science. And this building opened in 1938. It's much more modest than Kingswood or the School for Boys, and it's much more uh, modest than the Art Museum, which would open four years later. It has a much more functional appearance to it, uh, and it really gets its interest from, I think, two places. One is uh, this great uh, entrance feature where you have the cast concrete, the reinforced concrete that is sort of tilting down and coming to this very thin lip supported on limestone columns that have um, these very cool uh, right angles to quarter rolls, the Carl Millis sculptures. But every Cranbrook institution has a sort of icon. So whether that's the boys' school's tower, Brookside School's tower, Kingswood chimneys, or the art museum with its columns. So what would the icon of the Institute of Science be? And it is, of course, the light standard, which, okay, working in gloves today because it is about freezing. They don't quite want to hit the button. Uh, the light standard was actually conceived of by George Booth. And in the archives, there is a letter written from Booth to Saarinen, uh, which I have duplicated here. And in it, George Booth writes to Saarinen that 
He's quite bored on his vacation, and all he is doing is thinking about the Institute of Science. And so, in this letter from the Mount Washington in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, we see down here in the bottom corner. Again, this is a reproduction that I made from the original.、Uh, you see this little sketch, and that is George Booth's idea of how to make on this very simple building a new icon, and. I love this letter because George Booth writes to dear Mister Sarinen. Not having anything better to do, I have、uh, evolved this scheme attached for a column in the center of the circular parking space at the Institute of Science.、Um, so he says he goes on to think、uh, I may have suggested something too large in di、uh, dimension,、um, or or、uh, sort of. He goes on to be quite modest, and he even writes that essentially, by the time the letter gets to Sarnen, he might have changed his ideas again. He checks up on Mrs. Sarnen in the letter; she had been ill,、uh, and he writes about how、uh, glad he will be to get back and see all of you again. I hope Mrs. Sarnen is feeling better, and that my schemes do not trouble you too much. Which, if I know anything about Aliel Sarnen. When you have a client who's paying you to work here, to teach here, and building all of your buildings, there's really no such thing as being troubled too much. And so, of course, Aliel begins to incorporate、uh, George Booth's scheme for this icon into his design. Now, as Booth mentioned in the letter, the circular parking area was already thought out, and so it is a 20-foot diameter circle, and it's sitting、uh, so against Sarnen's advice and against his. Thought and I sort of agree with him.、Uh, the institute is really sitting in the middle of the 300-acre campus. Sarnen thought the middle should be preserved as a woodland area,、um, but instead George Booth was insistent that the institute go right here. So you drive in down this road, and again the building is is really quite.、Um, lovely but quite modest, and so you see the overhang, you see the original entrance, and then the parking was in this. Originally a twenty-foot、uh, diameter circle, and you parked towards the pylon. And if I just step over here, I hope I don't lose my connection to you all.、Uh, but you can see that it's really quite at the top of a hill, and so it looks straight down onto Kingswood Lake down below,、um, with which is where the old toboggan would be built in the winter, going down Suicide Hill. And so you can see how. The pylon is overlooking the property, and it's built out of limestone, glass block, and aluminum. Now, the designs for this pylon、uh, were developed. The drawings are dated December twenty third, nineteen thirty six, so Christmas Eve Eve. And as the sort of symbol of the institute, it's made out of limestone and not of brick. Now George Booth is the one who actually suggested it be made entirely out of lum- aluminum. I don't have a letter from Sarinen telling us why it's not made out of aluminum, but really using aluminum at all, which the aluminum louvers here and then the aluminum up at the top, it's Sarinen's second major use of aluminum on campus. The first being at Kingswood, where he used it.、Um, For light fixtures in the dining hall, but it really was a sort of the miracle material of the 20th century.、Um, after it had been able to be isolated, and the sort of ability to industrially process aluminum came about in the 1920s. Some of the first architects to use this shiny, rust-proof, lightweight, ductile material、um, were people uh, like. Uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller in the Dymaxium House of 1933, that's now at the Henry Ford Museum, or the Empire State Building with its great spire of aluminum. And so Sarnen's really sort of thinking right on the uh, uh, forefront of architectural materials when he、uh, is working in aluminum here. Of course, George Booth suggested that they use prefabricated aluminum standard measurements, but. There's really nothing standard at Cranbrook, so everything here is custom. The limestone is is our regular Indiana limestone, so the same material that the art museum steps are made out of. All of the stone at the Cranbrook School for Boys and all of the stone sculptures, the steps at Kingswood are all、um, are all Indiana limestone. 
and this vent on this side, which we go through an aluminum vent and then into a bug screen. And then you actually can, if you're a little kid or if you're me with a camera, you can see that the light, of course, is hollow. Uh, it leads into the inner chamber. There's a wooden board, uh, a wooden plank floor here. There's then a drain that drains the entire light shaft and it comes out into the parking lot. And then there are two light bulbs. So there's one right behind this wall. And as I was walking over here, I thought I should have had someone from facilities actually open it for us, but maybe later. Different live at five. There are two light bulbs. So there's one suspended here. Saarinen specified a 750 watt or a 1500 watt light bulb. Today it's a metal halide bulb of unknown wattage to me. And it's suspended on chains and it's shooting straight up through the light shaft. And then it is met at the top by a second light bulb. And that light bulb is on a pulley system. So when the lights go out, the electrician simply opens the louver down here on the ground and then uses the chain and pulley to drop down the second light all the way through the light shaft. To give you a sense of scale, each one of these blocks are 11 and 5 eighths inches. So once you put the grout line in or the mortar line, you're looking at a foot square on these blocks. And you, uh, Sarnin's really using glass box as you would traditional masonry. And so he is stacking them up. And then as he gets three feet high, there is a steel rod going across. And so every three blocks, there's a steel rod that's tying into the limestone corners. And you don't have to know much about structures to think, Kevin, that's not a lot of limestone on the corner. How is this thing actually standing up? Well, I was looking back at the drawings in Cranbrook archives and how this is detailed is essentially these blocks here are much thicker. And so there is a steel rod that is uh, sort of drilled into the limestone block at the base. And then it runs 28 feet up through each of the four corners. And at the top, there is a nut and bolt and it's bolted to a steel plate at the top. And so the entire thing is sort of reinforced by these 28 foot straight steel rods. And then the horizontal steel rods are keeping the whole thing rigid. Now at the top, the cap of the whole uh, light pylon, it has the aluminum louvers, uh, but then it's also again made out of uh, uh, aluminum. And so you have that shiny, self-cleaning, reflective surface that isn't really reflecting at all today. So what else can I tell you about the pylon? If you have any questions, be sure to type them in. I hope I am remaining connected here. Um, so in the original design of the Institute, the light pylon, it sort of stood to the side. So you drove in and you glanced past the main building and then you parked and you walked in this stairway. In 1955, uh, Walter Kapp, the great Detroit architect, probably most famous for designing Meadowbrook Hall. He was on the board of directors at the Institute of Science and he built Michigan's first planetarium here in 1955. Now, Cap used the exact same um, sort of Cranbrook brick, this beige mottled brick for his addition. And I think it's really sympathetic to Aliel's architecture. A couple of years later, Cranbrook Institute of Science made its um, sort of first great mistake, which was enclosing this porch here. So it was originally a terrace with bay leaves sitting along it. And so this porch was actually fully free floating and you could walk straight through onto a terrace on the front of the building. But the real change, the biggest change to the Institute of Science in what was not a mistake at all, because I love this building, is the addition of Stephen Hull's 1998 Institute wing. And on this wing, Stephen Hull, who is a Washington-born, Washington State-born, New York practicing architect, develops the Light Laboratory. And so the picture we use to advertise today's talk, as well as the what you're seeing in your screen now, 
is the sort of conversation between Aliol and George Booth's light pylon and then Stephen Hull's light laboratory. Now, the light pylon being on this hill, you can see it from Woodward Avenue. So if you know, if you're sitting in the passenger seat and you know generally where Cranbrook is, you actually can see this through the woods because there's nothing as high as the light pylon all the way to Woodward. Certainly, if, if you have the occasion to be on campus at night, um, you'll be surprised where this pops up sort of in the distance. If you come in through the Woodward entrance, it is sort of guiding you into the middle of campus. And so this is really a beacon. The light laboratory is a little bit different. Uh, it is a beacon in its own right, certainly on evenings when the observatory is open and the institute is open until 10 p.m. You're sort of invited into this very warm glow of a building, but it's really meant to be understood from the inside. And so Stephen Hull wanted this room to be a great two-story white space where all of these different processes of making glass would project light into the light laboratory and children and adults could learn about how glass affects the refracting and reflection of glass. So um, all of these different ways of manipulating light and, or, and through glass and of using different textured glasses are then shot inside into, um, into the light laboratory. And we'll see here the way that Stephen Hull creates this sort of very unusual construction of windows here in the entrance to the Institute of Science and the way that it really frames a view back out towards the light laboratory. Hopefully a little bit later this winter or spring we'll be doing an interior tour of the Institute of Science. Um, it is a pretty great building. But What's remarkable to me is that the light pylon didn't move uh, when they added this 1998 edition, uh, yet it did become, I think, even more of a central element to the, the Institute of Science before it was sort of beside the building, but now it is uh, really linking together the two major wings. And so it's marking the new modern entrance from Stephen Hull, uh, and then it is sort of perfectly positioned in this courtyard plaza space. Now, I really was hoping that the light pylon would come on by now. I am seeing most of the lights for the evening have come on. Um, but I'm not sure that we're actually going to see it lit up. So sorry about that. I don't know if anyone has any other questions. Um, I am busy planning out the next couple of months of Live at Five. So if you have a space that you would like to go, I have had requests to tour the Performing Arts Center, Christchurch, Cranbrook, um, as well as to go back to the Frank Lloyd Wright House. I'd like to get us inside the Institute of Science here. Of course, if there are other individual artworks or pieces of furniture or sculpture on campus that you want me to talk about, uh, do send them to us as a message or email us at center at cranbrook.edu. Now on January 25th, I will be starting my annual History of American Architecture, this year focusing on Cranbrook visitors. So looking at 15 architects who came to Cranbrook and lectured between 1935 and 2016. And I'm gonna talk about how those architects uh, visiting Cranbrook really represent sort of a microcosm of American architecture. So in most cases, I don't actually know what the architects said while they were here. In the more recent ones, I have videos of their talks, but for the older architects, I'm speculating. Uh, but I think it's gonna be a really interesting interesting way to think about the history of 20th century architecture from the 1930s to the present as sort of um, what, what were young architects learning from older architects, who were the people who came to Cranbrook to speak, where were they coming from, and what kind of buildings were they designing. So I'm busy preparing for that lecture series now, and again it starts on Monday, January 25th, and it runs for five weeks, uh, and we're doing it because it is virtual, we'll do it twice each Monday. So it's going to be at 11 a.m. If you are on the West Coast, you can watch it before you go to work. If you're in London, you can watch it in the evening. Uh, and then we'll also be doing it at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern as well. So 11 
and 7 Eastern Monday nights for five weeks starting January 25th. You do need to get tickets and you can get those at center.cranbrook.edu. If you are a Cranbrook student, our Cranbrook faculty, students are free and we do have a faculty rate. So just email us to sign up uh, with either of those processes. I do have one year's worth of lectures online. You can see last year's series, Cranbrook, um, uh, History of American Architecture, Cranbrook in Context. And that is a history of Cranbrook's campus. And so if you've stuck with Live at Five <laughs> this long, which I know many of you have, um, you have learned a lot about Cranbrook's campus. But if you want to do um, just a marathon eight hours of Cranbrook with Kevin, uh, those YouTube videos are available. And so um, uh, you can check those out online on the Center for Collections and Research YouTube page. Now, my last thought, I really was, oh, there it came on. Look at that, the light pylon. I was about to give up. I never, never, never lose faith, everyone. Um, so my last fact about the light pylon, and it's referenced in George Booth's letter to Aelil Sarnen, is that he wanted it not only to be an icon every day, but to also be functional and ceremonial. And so the function of it is that it is the only light for the parking lot. And so as those metal halide lights warm up, they're going to get progressively brighter. Um, and they do provide the only illumination for all of the cars, and that is by design. But then he also thought, what are we going to do on really special days? I don't know um, how Booth would have thought of those days, but, you know, maybe Nobel Prize in Science, a great scientific discovery, an anniversary. And so Booth proposed adopting a airplane airline searchlight. So this is right before World War II. Um, and he envisioned putting a searchlight on top of the pylon so that on special occasions and holidays, we could shoot light straight up into the skies. We'd be like that haunted house up in Pontiac, uh, you know, seen from miles around. So I do sort of uh, wish that we had installed the ceremonial searchlight, uh, but it obviously, it, it was not a feature that survived the continued development uh, of this design. How tall is the pylon? That is a great question. Um, so the whole thing is 30 feet, 10, inch, 10 and one quarter inch high. So essentially 31 feet, but not quite. It's four feet, eight and a quarter inches wide and it's sitting on a 20-foot radius for the, the uh, planted base. The, the flower and grass base is 20 feet. I think earlier I said the whole thing was. It's much larger than 20 feet. So I hope you enjoyed this tour of the 30-foot, 10 and a quarter inch light pylon here at the Institute of Science. It's looking eerily green in the video. It is not in person. It's actually a lovely white color. Um, I think it's one of the greatest collaborations between uh, Aelil Saarinen and his patron, George Booth. I'll be back on Tuesday with another Live at Five virtual tour on Instagram at Cranbrook Center. And I'll be back next Wednesday for another Live at Five tour here on the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research Facebook page. I hope everyone is doing well, being safe, wearing masks, and I look forward to taking you somewhere else on our 319 acre campus next Wednesday. Until then, have a great evening and may the light of the pylon shine upon us all.